It is always good to be with you here in Sunnyside. Uh, A lot of great memories. Uh, You can tell the depth of friendship that Dan and I have based on the fact that he invited me to speak on Daylight Savings Sunday, (laughs) right? So with all my heart, I want to thank Dan. Uh, And I'm going to preach a completely different sermon than what he thinks I'm going to preach. No, I'm kidding. Uh, No, seriously, it it is great to be back and even... I had to take an Uber from Queensboro Plaza because the 7 train wasn't running, um, which it was supposed to be running, but something happened and they said, sorry, forget about it. But coming down 43rd Avenue, it's like places, people, like all this stuff coming back to mind. So it is good to be back with you, uh, especially on this second Sunday of Lent. And I know that not all Christians observe Lent, perhaps you're a follower of Jesus who doesn't observe Lent. There is, and that's fine. There's no biblical mandate that says thou shalt observe Lent. But Christians through the centuries have used Lent to do something we're commanded to do all the time, which is what Jesus says in the verses just prior to what Casey read in Luke 9, verse 23, where Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Now, this is not our text for today, but it is super relevant to what we're discussing because this is five verses ahead of what was just read. And what was just read said this was about eight days after Jesus said this. So it's all kind of in the same within a week or so. Jesus says, deny yourself. So whether or not you observe Lent, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is a command that you take seriously. That we're supposed to deny ourselves. Uh, Another word for this is one you've already heard today, which is the word kenosis, which is a fancy way of saying self-emptying. This idea comes from the Greek word behind the phrase in Philippians chapter 2, where it says that Jesus made himself nothing. He literally emptied himself by becoming a servant, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus is the supreme example of denying oneself, and he calls those who follow him to a life of self-denial and kenosis and self-emptying. That's why last week, Amanda's emphasis in this Lenten series is on removing the clutter from our lives that has entangled our souls. It's part of this process of self-emptying. And again, whether you observe Lent or not, it's something Christians are simply called to do. It's part of denying ourselves. But friends, it's a scary proposition to empty ourselves. What does it mean to deny oneself? Frankly, there's a lot of misunderstanding around this question. Uh, On the one hand, and and maybe this is some of the, maybe, maybe this is the reason some of you don't observe Lent. On the one hand, denying oneself can become sort of a a self-salvation project. Like, I'm going to do this stuff to get God to notice that I'm really serious about him. And some of you are like, I don't observe Lent because I don't want to go down that path of self-salvation. I know that I can't save myself. But on the other hand, when you think about denying oneself, it can go a different direction. Because denying ourselves sounds like denying who God made us to be. And negating our identity, negating who we are, that we're supposed to be just some kind of personality-less blob over here that God just does stuff with. Now, all of us have to come to terms with this command, whether we observe Lent or not. And today's, and that's where today's story is so helpful for us, because through this story that was just read, God exposes Two ways, both ways that we misunderstand self-denial, that we misunderstand kenosis. And then it shows us what it really is. In other words, what God is doing in this passage is he's taking the scariness out of our emptiness. And that's the title for this sermon today. Taking the scariness out of our emptiness. This is a familiar story. It's told by three out of four gospel writers. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this story for us. So we have a lot of, uh, uh, of understanding of what's going on, a lot of familiarity with it. It's often referred to as the transfiguration. And the story kind of breaks down into two, two events. Two things happen. And then after each of those things, there are two responses. So you have event response, event response. The transfiguration is the first event 
This is where Jesus' face, the Bible says, the appearance of his face changed. Literally, this says that the appearance of his face became other. What does that mean? I don't know. And his clothes shined. Now his appearance changed. He's bright, like a flash of lightning bright. Okay? His appearance changed, but he was still recognizable. Okay? That you could still see this was Jesus, but something was going on here. That's why Christians long ago made up the word transfigure, because it's like, I don't know how else to describe it. He had a figure, and it was changed. So he's transfigured into something glorious. And in this moment, Jesus is so glorified that it's almost like a light source has entered into his body and is now shining out through him, through his face, through his body, such that even the clothes are just glowing. It's remarkable. He's still recognizable, but now he's appearing in all of his glory. And that's not all that happens in this first event. Not only is Jesus' figure changed, but in addition to that, two people show up. Two people who lived centuries before Jesus and Peter, James, and John lived. And not just any two people who lived centuries earlier, but Moses and Elijah. This is not just like random Bible trivia here. Like, "Mm, who should I send to be with Jesus as he's glorified? Oh, let's just pick these two people and throw them in. This will be fun. Moses and Elijah are two of the greats in the scriptures. In fact, when you think about it, Moses is the one through whom the Torah comes. He's the one who led the people of Israel out of Egypt. He's really the one who constituted the people of Israel, not just as a family enslaved in another country, but as its own nation with its own laws and its own land. Moses is the great lawgiver. And then you have Elijah. Elijah lives hundreds of years after Moses and hundreds of years before Jesus. Okay, there's the history for you, right, Pete? Get that context right. Um, He lives hundreds of years after Moses, and he is the first of something new. He's the first of the prophets, the great preaching and writing prophets, who show up on the scene to say, hey, nation, we have not been loyal to the God who made a covenant with us back with Moses. And he's the first of the prophets that start calling all the people back to repentance, to the original way. So you've got the great lawgiver Moses and the great prophet Elijah who appear with Jesus. These aren't just three random characters on the mountain. Now that's the event, the first event in this story. What is the response? Well, you find in verse 32 that Peter, James, and John had fallen asleep, which unfortunately is a common theme with these fellas when they're with Jesus and he's praying. And let's be honest, it's probably a common theme for us when we're with Jesus and we're praying too. Now, when Peter wakes up, he sees what's going on. He sees Jesus. I mean, who could miss him, right? Sees Jesus. And then he's like, wait, who are these other people? And once he realizes who it is, and don't ask me how he figured that out, okay? It's not like they had pictures, right? (laughs) But yeah, he looks just like that Polaroid my mom took, or it's passed down to my mom, or whatever. Like, I don't know, but he figured it out. He figured out Jesus looks like he's never looked before. He figures out Moses and Elijah are talking with him. He's listening to their conversation. And then he realizes they're about to leave. That's when he pipes up and says something. This is the response. He says, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters. Okay, three tents, three tabernacles. The impression that I get from this is, He is experiencing the most remarkable experience of his young life. And now Moses and Elijah are walking away and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not not ready for this to be done yet. 
Like, stick around for a while. We'll build you tents to stay in. Okay? I don't want this moment to end. Let's keep all of you here. I mean, Jesus, look at you. You've never looked better. Okay? And and Moses, you are finally made it into the promised land. Where are you going? And Elijah, the ending of your life was as mysterious as it gets. You got to tell us what happened. Now, even though his response is likely prompted by him not wanting this moment to end, I want you to notice that there is a deep, I'm, I'm going to use this word and I mean it positively. There's a deep religiosity to what he's suggesting. I'll, I'll say it a different way. There's a deep spirituality to what he's suggesting. Remember, there's no one greater in the Hebrew scriptures than Moses and Elijah. In fact, humanly speaking, there would be no Hebrew scriptures without Moses and Elijah. That's where it all came from. It started with those two. And what Peter is doing in this moment is he's saying he wants, he wants, he wants to build these tents for these three. And notice he doesn't say, let's build six tents for the three of you and the three of us. He's not putting himself on a level with them. He's recognizing, wow, something's going on with those three that elevates them above me. It's an act of humility, right? And what he's saying in this moment is Moses is the great lawgiver. Elijah is the great prophet. Jesus, you're as great as they are. I will, we will build three tents for you. Isn't that amazing, Jesus? That's how high I revere you and esteem you. I elevate you all the way to the level of Moses. His heart seems to be in the right place. And yet, there comes a second event. And the second event is terrifying. The second event, of course, is this cloud that's coming in while Peter is making this suggestion. And the cloud covers the mountain, and it's terrifying. And then if that wasn't scary enough, now a voice from within the cloud that they themselves are in booms out. This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. See what the voice is saying? It's saying, Peter, you think you've done great service in honoring Jesus by putting him on a level with the great Moses and the great Elijah. But in in fact, all your religiosity, all your spirituality, even your agenda planning based on your religiosity here, all of it actually downgrades Jesus from his actual status. He's not just a great servant like Moses and Elijah. This is my son. And friends, this illustrates for us the first of two ways that we misinterpret what it means to empty ourselves, what it means for us to give ourselves to God. In our efforts at self-denial, we often believe that Emptying myself means attaching Jesus to my righteous agenda. I've got rightly motivated plans. I know my Bible. And I'm going to do some stuff and just stick Jesus onto it. So in a sense, in this way, emptying ourselves means sort of like emptying myself of sinful stuff and filling myself with religious stuff and righteous stuff and spiritual stuff and going out on a mission and fulfilling my agenda in the name of Jesus. That always works well, doesn't it? We decide at the beginning of the year, this year I'm going to read my Bible through. Nothing's going to stop me. And then something interrupts our quiet time and we just become a bear and we lash out at other people. Yeah, that's the whole point of being in prayer, so that you can lash out at people. Or we parents take a Bible verse like, well, children are supposed to obey their parents. So we demand unyielding obedience. And in the meantime, we never display to our kids the loving kindness of God. We think we're doing what God wants, but we're actually bringing Jesus down from his exalted position. In society, we, get, we as followers of Jesus can get so wrapped up in winning a political argument that we fail to consider the effects of our winning on our testimony for Jesus. Such that when people hear, when people hear us talk about Jesus, all they think about is a political viewpoint. 
And they don't want anything to do with him because they disagree with the political viewpoint. What have we done? We fundamentally misconstrue the concept of kenosis, of giving ourselves to Jesus, because we think what it means to empty ourselves is to fill ourselves with religious ideology and religious agendas that actually bring Jesus down from his exalted status as son. Is it any wonder why the church's witness is so ineffective? And friends, when God exposes to us, whether through a sermon or through a cloud and a voice, when God exposes to us that all we've done is attach Jesus to our righteous agenda, our response is the same as the disciples in verse 36. We're kind of left silent. Keeping this to ourselves, like, mm, not going to say a word. This was their reaction to the second event. They said nothing. And really, what could they say? I mean, they'd been humbled already by their own misinterpretation of Jesus and their attempt to wrangle Jesus to fit into their agenda. And friends, this reaction illustrates for us the second way that we misunderstand kenosis. If at some times we think emptying ourselves means doing a lot of religious and spiritual stuff in the name of Jesus, at other times... We think denying ourselves means turning ourselves into something we're not. We go from being humbled to being humiliated. To suppressing who we really are. At its worst, this idea, and I don't know of anyone who actually teaches or preaches this. This is something that some of us internalize when we think about denying ourselves. At its worst, for some of us, it means that we treat ourselves as worthless. And we believe we have to become a different person in order to be acceptable to God. I'll just stay silent and just do some things and just kind of stay out of everyone else's way. If I can use a personal illustration, okay, I'm, I'm uh, Myers-Briggs, uh, I'm INFJ. Okay, which some of you know me well enough that you didn't need me to tell you that. Um, you know, Enneagram stuff, right? Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm, I'm an Enneagram four. Um, so you know, at, and I, I've been wanting. I've, I've sort of aimed at being in pastoral ministry for a very long time. I was a teenager when I first started down this path. Um, but at various points in my Christian formation. I was either told directly or it was suggested to me that those four, the I, the N, the F, the J, like I could not be any of those things if I wanted to be a pastor. Like I, like I remember specifically one mentor saying, you can't be an introvert if you're going to be a pastor. You can't, sorry. And all four of them, maybe, maybe not that directly, but all four of those I was told, well, if you're going to, if you're going to go into ministry, you can't, you can't be this, you can't be oriented towards feelings, Right? Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving, right? Like all this stuff. So what I internalize from that is in order for me to follow Jesus, I have to be somebody I'm not. And see, that's what I what I mean when I say we misunderstand emptiness. God is not calling us to just sit there, be quiet, and let me maybe make something out of your life. Friends, God has something far better for us than either of these paths. And it all starts right here, when either in our humbled state, that we've done a lot of religious stuff in the name of Jesus, that has, hasn't actually honored Jesus, or in our silent state, where we feel we cannot be ourselves if we're going to follow Jesus. It all starts right here, in that moment, when we open our eyes and we see Jesus alone, as they did in verse 36. You see, God is not calling you to a set of principles. He's not calling you to a moral code. He's calling you to a person. And that person is Jesus. We don't need another lawgiver. We don't need another prophet. We need the very Son of God. And the question is not, what can we do for the Son of God? But what has the Son of God done for us? 
And we see it right here in verse 31, where we find what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about. They were talking about, the verse says, they spoke about his departure. Literally, his exodus. Now, there's a Greek word you know. Because that word exodus is normally tied to Moses. And the exodus, big capital E. The word means to go out. Moses and Elijah are talking to Jesus about his going out. Well, what does that entail? For Moses, his exodus was all about leading the people of Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea. That's how he went out. For Elijah, his exodus looked like chariots of fire coming down from heaven and whisking him away. That's how he went out. And yet they spoke with Jesus not about their departure, but about his exodus. Because his exodus would not be like theirs. Moses' exodus was all about survival. Crossing the Red Sea on dry ground. Making it safely to the other side. Elijah's exodus was so stunning that he bypassed death altogether. Both Moses and Elijah escaped death. What was Jesus' exodus? How would he depart this life? Friends, Jesus would not escape death the way Moses and Elijah did. No, his departure took him right into the jaws of death. And it was a death, the verse says, of his own choosing. He was about to bring its fulfillment. He went right at it. He knew it was coming, and he was going to bring it about. It was his choice. Again, remember the picture. In his glorified state, with light shining out of him from his face, through his clothes, even in that moment, he knew that the real glory, the lasting glory, the glory that would not fade after the cloud lifted, he knew that the eternal glory was on the other side of the cross. And friends, that moment on the cross would be the moment of his emptying, where he poured himself out by becoming a servant, as Philippians 2 tells us, and he gave himself up entirely to the will of God. This is the ultimate kenosis. This is the only act of self-denial in the history of the universe that really matters. Because in his kenosis, in his emptying, Jesus gave his life for the life of the world. His exodus is unlike Moses and Elijah's, and his emptying is unlike yours and mine. Because his emptying means the salvation of the world. His death means the forgiveness of sins. His crucifixion means the undoing both of our evil deeds and of our self-righteousness. All the stuff that fills us up. His emptying means that we go free. And friends, that challenges that first misunderstanding of kenosis, that somehow we just attach Jesus to our righteous agenda. No, the path of following Jesus is not pushing our own agenda, but setting our own agenda aside and being a servant, emptying ourselves by becoming a servant. Yes, we take Jesus seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. Because we know that we're going to get it wrong way more than we'd like to think. Maybe we get it wrong more often than we get it right. Probably. But that's okay, because it's not our self-emptying that is going to do the world or ourselves any good. It's Jesus alone, his self-emptying for us, that infuses our life with meaning. But that's not all, because on the third day, Jesus walked out of that grave. His death was not the end of the story. He rose from the dead so that he might be all in all. So that as Ephesians 1 says, he might be the one who fills. Remember, we're talking about emptying. Jesus is the one who fills everything in every way. That includes you and me. He fills us in every way. He is everything you ever wanted. He really is all in all. He is the very life of a dying world. And notice, friends, when Jesus emptied himself on the cross by becoming a servant, he never gave up who he really was. He did not cease to become the Son of God. He did, self-denial did not mean denial of his identity. 
He poured himself out as he was. And that corrects this second misunderstanding that somehow we have to become someone else in order to follow Jesus. No, no. Jesus takes us as we are. He made you the way he, he made you. Yeah, and yeah, we all have areas in which we need to grow and ways we need to humble ourselves and repent. Absolutely. But think about it. We often give Peter a hard time for being the first person to spout off the first thing that comes to his, his mind, right? We do. Who got up on Pentecost and spoke? Who was the one who spouted off that day? Who was used of God to bring 3,000 people in? See, this is not a matter of Peter, like, stop it, Peter. Stop being that guy. Stop being so talkative. No, no, God redeems all of it. And on Pentecost, he proved it. So for us, if this is where you land, like I do, well, I may land on both, but I'm talking about this right now. If this is part of your inner dialogue, God can redeem all of it. Every bit of it. You don't have to be less talkative or more assertive, or less pushy, or more whatever, right? The Spirit will tell you when you're sinning. He will, because he's concerned about your wholeness, and the wholeness of others around you. But as long as you're acting, thinking, like, i got to pretend to be somebody else in order for God to use me, you'll be no good to yourself or to the world. God made you the way he made you for a reason. And friends, that's why this is beautiful, and this is where I'll end. When he told us disciples to deny ourselves, he added this promise. He said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will save it. He doesn't say empty yourself and become a drop in the ocean of my church. Indistinguishable from anyone else. Emptying yourself doesn't mean filling yourself up with a religious agenda, nor does it mean turning yourself into someone else. When you actually turn over your whole life to Jesus, when you finally give up, Jesus says your life will be saved. And that, friends, is the remarkable lesson from this story. When you give yourself up to Jesus, he gives you your true self back in return. You become who you really are. Yes, emptiness can be scary. Scary. Removing the clutter from our lives can be painful. Repenting of our self-righteousness can be humiliated. But friends, this is the path Jesus walked ahead of us. So he's made it safe for us to follow after. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being all in all and for filling everything in every way. We pray for the faith to grasp these realities. The faith to turn from our self-righteous agendas. And the faith to turn from a kind of humiliated, shame-filled view of denying ourselves. You made us beautiful. You made us good. Yes, we have sought out many schemes. But you looked out over all of your creation, including humanity, and said, very good. So teach us to accept the gifts you put in us. Teach us to silence the inner critic and listen to your spirit. And teach us what it means to be filled with Jesus, that his fruit might be born through us. For we ask in his name. Amen.